Tonight, police arrest three men accused of killing a BC sick activist on Canadian soil. Murder was outrageous and it was reprehensible. What CBC News has learned about the alleged hit squad, which investigators believe was directed by the Indian government and the other murders that could be linked. Hey. Oh my God. After a wrong way police chase ends in tragedy, we break down what justifies high speed pursuits. Skyrocketing costs. We cannot look back. The price tag for hosting the FIFA World Cup balloons by tens of millions. I think the numbers are shocking. Is bringing the beautiful game to Canada worth it? From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansi. Three men are in custody tonight, accused of the brazen killing of a prominent Sikh separatist in British Columbia. CBC News was first to report that RCMP arrested three Indian nationals. Sources say investigators believe they were members of a hit squad directed by the Indian government. Hardeep Singh Nijar was gunned down at his Surrey Gurdwara last summer. And Canada's accusation that India was involved sparked a serious diplomatic fight. The arrest now, a major move in the investigation, but police say it is not over. Tonight we have complete coverage with reporters in Niger's home community of Surrey, B.C., to Ottawa and Mumbai, where reaction is being closely watched. But let's begin with what we learned about those arrests today, the alleged hit squad, and whether it could be connected to more murders in Canada. Our Evan Dyer broke this story and takes us through it. Hardeep Singh Niger walks to his pickup truck unaware that his killers are waiting at his Surrey Gurdwara in this video obtained by the CBC's Fifth Estate. Police say the three men now arrested were part of this hit squad, apprehended separately in morning raids in Edmonton after more than 10 months of investigation. The murder of Mr. Niger at the Scott Road Gurdwara was outrageous and it was reprehensible. Niger was a prominent Sikh separatist seen as an enemy by the government of India. Canadian investigators soon became convinced that New Delhi was behind the killing. Agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen. India reacted with furious denials, expelling diplomats and banning Canadians from getting tourist visas. But sources close to the investigation believe the alleged hit squad may be connected to more killings. Just two days after Justin Trudeau publicly accused India, Sakdul Singh Gill, a man India had listed just one day before as a terrorist, was shot multiple times in Winnipeg. Six weeks after that, a brutal daylight shooting. The victims were Punjabi organized crime figure Harpreet Uppal and his 11-year-old son, Gavin. The shooter or the shooters learned that the son was there. They intentionally killed him. No charges have been laid in those cases. Sources say those charged with Nitra's murder are Indian nationals who entered Canada on temporary visas, some as fake international students. Nidger's close associate, who U.S. authorities say was also targeted by an Indian government murder plot, says this is the beginning. So what uh, uh, Canadian agencies have today have arrested the Modi's uh, hit squad and basically they have arrested the foot soldiers. But the kingpins who orchestrated and who planned and executed the assassinations. There are separate and distinct investigations ongoing into these matters, certainly not limited to the involvement of the people arrested today. And these efforts include investigating connections to the government of India. Two former directors of Canada's spy agencies say they believe New Delhi is responsible and not rogue operatives. Do I think the Indians were part of it? Yeah, I have thought that from the beginning. People do not go off on tangents in the Indian public service and succeed. Evan, you broke this story today. You've been following it for a long time. And sources are telling you there's some interesting connections here with criminal gangs. That's right. Now, investigators, I should say, remain firmly convinced that the murder of Hardeep Singh Nidra was ordered at the highest levels 
of the Indian government, but they're less sure that the Indian government ordered the other killings that they're looking at, Ian. You know, the use of criminals is not only a feature of the Indian government, this is something that investigators say is more and more common when governments want to conduct illegal operations in other countries, including the intimidation and even the murder of dissidents. And as one source put it, why risk sending government people when you can get so much mileage working with organized crime? Evan Dyer in Ottawa, thank you. Thanks, Ian. Niger's death rattled his community in Surrey, British Columbia, and police say tremendous support from that community helped get them to this day. Georgie Smythe brings us their reaction tonight. The Gurdwara where Harib Singh Niger was killed is where his community gathered as arrests were announced. He was an upright individual, a peaceful man with the demonstrated commitment to community service. Nisha some Balraj and some members of the Gurdwara were briefed on the murder charges first. How do you feel about it? No comment. Good afternoon, everyone. My name Police had more to say about the sprawling investigation. These individuals were charged with the conspiracy uh, to commit murder, so there may be others involved. We don't ever want to say um, that yeah, the investigation has stopped. Nisha was a temple leader and a prominent Sikh activist who advocated for the creation of a distinct Sikh state in India, known as Khalistan. India branded him a terrorist. In terms of the arrest of these three individuals on the street level who are believed to have actually carried out the assassination, I think it's important to put it in that fuller context of how India operates and conducts these kinds of activities. A question Sikhs here are anxious to have answered. I think the idea of safety will only be kind of relevant if India is actually held accountable. Um, you know, calling them out, I think, has always been one part of it. Uh, what are we going to do about it, I think, has been the question that's been lingering. It's taken 10 months for charges to be laid. A timeline former BC Premier Ujjal Dosanjh says is justified. In these kinds of investigations that might involve cross-border investigations, they do take a long time. And, uh, and the police, rather than doing a haphazard job, have to do a uh, a proper job so that they, it, the, the evidence can stand up in the court. So, you know, I understand all of those issues and it takes time. Police are now asking for help to piece together the actions of the accused men around the Gurdwara in the lead up to the murder last year. The trio will be in BC to face court on Monday. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Surrey. Let's head to India where people are waking up to this news. The CBC South Asia correspondent Salima Shivji is in Mumbai. And Salima, this news broke very late there. Yes, and that timing meant no immediate reaction from the Indian government on this. But it is making headlines. And officials here have always uh, really been vociferous in their denials of the allegations from Canada that the Indian government orchestrated the alleged assassination plot, calling it absurd and motivated. And India has been quite bullish in their interactions with Canadian officials on this, in contrast to the more muted and cooperative reaction to the U.S. after officials there unsealed an indictment alleging and detailing an alleged botched assassination plot stateside. Compare that to Canada. It's similar to Canada's allegations, but a very different reaction from India. And honestly, some people here have actually welcomed the allegations as a sign that it means that India is in the big leagues, that it can stand up to people it considers its enemies, even and including Sikh separatists abroad. And India is in the midst of an election, and the Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself has even uh, mentioned this, alluded to this in a speech actually on the campaign trail. At a rally in April, he boasted that even India's enemies know this is Modi, this is the new India. It can come into your home and kill you. In terms of what these arrests could do to Canada-India relations, they're not so great anyway, even though visa services have resumed and trade is untouched diplomatic relations are still very chilly, and these arrests certainly won't change that. Salim Shivji in Mumbai. A former CSIS officer says police should investigate other unexplained killings. We'll speak to him coming up on The Breakdown. The Commissioner of Ottawa's Foreign Interference Inquiry has delivered an interim report. As Ashley Burke explains, while the report says the final outcome of elections wasn't changed, foreign meddling has left what it describes as a stain on the democratic process. She reviewed top secret intelligence, heard from dozens of witnesses, 
Now the head of a public inquiry says foreign interference has had an impact. Some of these acts have been established while others remain only suspected, are a stain on our electoral process. But Marie-José Ugg says it wasn't serious enough to affect the outcome of the past two federal elections. Nor did this foreign interference have any impact on which party formed the government. In the Her first report points to two examples of potential Chinese meddling. That includes a disinformation campaign that could have cost conservative Kenny Chu his seat in 2021. This information may have led to the election of one candidate over another, but I cannot say for sure. The commissioner also said it's possible that China interfered in a liberal nomination race in Don Valley North in 2019. Some intelligence suggested the consulate intimidated international students into voting for Han Dong. He denies any involvement. Ugg says nomination races lack safeguards. The Conservatives call the report damning. The Liberal Party uh, needs to tighten up its rules. I think it's clear through uh, this first report that there are major problems uh, with the way in which Liberals uh, have structured their party. The report also says information CSIS shares with the government can be too broad or vague. The public safety minister says he's open to recommendations. I uh, am very confident uh, that the intelligence information that's important for me uh, or for others in the uh, intelligence apparatus of the government is shared appropriately. The commissioner said perhaps the greatest harm that Canada has suffered is that foreign adversaries accomplished one of their goals, reducing the public's trust in Canadian democracy. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. At several Canadian universities, there's defiance as protesters dig in. Alsa Northcott zeroes in on one of their key demands, that institutions cut financial links with Israel. Nearly a week in, McGill's protest encampment is still going. The morale has not uh, dropped. We uh, still see the community coming in and out. And at similar encampments at other Canadian universities, the same result. We are here demanding that the University of Toronto divest from Israeli apartheid. Quebec's premier has called the McGill encampment illegal. And while McGill has asked for police assistance, officers have not moved in to dismantle it. Nicole Nashen says the protest leaves her and other Jewish students feeling unsafe and targeted. I feel abandoned. I feel like m my community has, my Jewish community has become strengthened because we feel like everyone else has let us down. But demonstrators say the protests won't end until universities meet their demands to divest from funds, institutions and companies with ties to Israel. If they're investing in companies that are responsible for war, uh, for military equipment, then that runs against the mandate of a university. Divesting from certain companies has been done before. Several institutions, including McGill, sold off investments in businesses linked to apartheid South Africa in the 1980s. And McGill recently committed to divesting from fossil fuel companies. This isn't hard. This isn't rocket science. There are fund managers that investors hire to manage their portfolios who specialize in uh, managing uh, investments to be socially and environmentally responsible. But others say it's not always clear where funds go, making divestment long and complicated. It is extraordinarily difficult. So I doubt many universities will divest. Those that do will have very small um, small uh, investment portfolios related to Israel. McGill has said it has a process in place to raise concern about divestment. The protesters say they need more than that to force the university to act. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. After a massive police crackdown on the protest encampment at Columbia University, New York police continue to make arrests at other campuses. The kids got their say whether we'd agree with it or not. They'll have their day in court. The schools are secure, and we're on to the next one. Dozens were arrested at NYU and the new school, adding to a tally of more than 2,300 at 44 campuses across the country since mid-April. In some cases, occupied buildings have been vandalized, including at Portland State University. At others, protests continued despite the fear of more arrests. As Russia ramps up its attacks on Ukraine, Britain is renewing its pledge to provide billions in military aid to Ukraine every year. But as Chris Brown tells us, it was the Foreign Secretary's comments about how those weapons could be used that has Russia responding. 
As Russia rehearses for Victory Day next week, its military leaders are finally seeing some actual victories on the battlefield in Ukraine they can celebrate. Russia has captured over 540 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory in recent months, said Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. It's not just a lack of ammunition that's hobbling Ukraine's defenses, it's also the lack of soldiers. We're unfortunately running out of people, said 28-year-old Alexander Kozachenko. Unless more of that $60 billion in military aid approved by the U.S. Congress arrives soon, the next few months may prove to be the toughest yet for Ukraine since Russia invaded just over two and a half years ago. The British government has promised Ukraine almost $4 billion of military aid a year for as long as it takes. The foreign secretary in Kyiv also said if Ukraine wants to use British donated weapons to hit Russia directly, they can. Let's be absolutely clear, Russia has launched an attack into Ukraine and Ukraine absolutely has the right to strike back at Russia. Among the biggest potential targets, Russia's bridge to occupied Crimea. Until now, out of range of most Ukrainian missiles, but with all of the new Western armaments on the way, maybe not for long. Cameron's remarks prompted a warning from Russia's foreign ministry. Any attempt to destroy the bridge would be met with a devastating revenge strike, said Maria Zaharova, who accused the West of using Ukraine to wage war on Russia. Ukrainians could sorely use any military victory about now. This Russian strike on a sports complex near Kharkiv injured eight children as Russia presses its advantage in manpower and weaponry to the maximum. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. In New York, a longtime aide to Donald Trump took the stand in his hush money trial, giving an inside look into damage control efforts in the final days before the 2016 presidential election. Hope Hicks testified that Trump told her to deny his affair with porn star Stormy Daniels and that the campaign was rattled by the Access Hollywood tape of Trump bragging about grabbing women's genitals. Trump has pleaded not guilty to falsifying business records to cover up a payment to Daniels. Legendary hockey announcer Bob Cole was laid to rest in St. John's today. Longtime colleague Ron McLean gave a warm and funny eulogy drawing on their decades-long friendship including a memorable story about how a summer boat trip turned into an icy dip in the North Atlantic. And I said, gee, it would sure be great to go for a dip. And Bob, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> Freaking icebergs are flying by not far from there. But anyway, he said, go on in, Ron. We'll stop the boat. Joseph, our captain. Joseph, stop the boat right here. We're going to have a dip. Go on, Ron. Tell us how the water is. <laughs> also paying his respects, former Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Danny Williams, who remembered Cole as a local hero. He's our hometown boy, and uh, we took great pride every time he called the game. And the other thing, too, is he, Bob painted the game. You know, when you listen to Bob's voice, you knew exactly what was going on on the ice. Bob Cole died last week at the age of 90. There's growing concern tonight about the mounting costs as Canada prepares to host matches at the 2026 FIFA World Cup. It is very tough to justify when a third of your costs go into just policing and security. Is the cost to taxpayers worth it? Next. Plus, a new movie tips its hat to the performers who risk it all. When you crash, you know, you still get whiplash, your, your internal organs get smashed around. Why some say it's time for stunt artists to get their due. And later, a magical moment on the side of the road. I teared up because it just, it felt so special. The rare sighting of a spirit moose. We're back in two. A police officer in Toronto is lucky to be alive after he was violently struck by an SUV. Police released shocking video of the incident, but keep in mind he only suffered minor injuries. On Tuesday, police were trying to arrest two auto theft suspects when one took off in a vehicle, hitting a pickup truck, then the officer. He was tossed in the air before landing on the pavement. Police still looking for the driver. Toronto and Vancouver are gearing up to host 13 games of the 2026 FIFA World Cup, but the costs are ballooning by millions. Jamie Strachan now with a mixed reaction to these pricey preparations. 
Today is a great day to be a soccer fan in the city of Toronto. Toronto Mayor Olivia Chow is optimistic about the city hosting part of the 2026 FIFA World Cup. There's no turning back now. The fans want us to move forward and uh, it's, we cannot look back. The cost to host six games in Toronto has ballooned to about $380 million, nearly $80 million more than what was forecast just two years ago. The federal government chipped in $100 million today, mostly for security and temporary stadium seating. For me personally, I don't think I'm going to be able to afford a ticket. They can always find money for a big event like this, but they sometimes can't find money for helping the people who really need it. Still, officials say the city will benefit, touting jobs and hundreds of thousands of visitors who will spend millions. But in a cash-strapped city, critics say six soccer games will do little to benefit Toronto. We're going to be on the hook for a lot of money, and as we all know, we've got a lot of unmet challenges and priorities in the city. In Vancouver, a similar story. The cost there to host seven games has surged to $581 million, more than double the original estimate. It's not a blank check. Um, we have to be very prudent with the numbers, and FIFA understands that. I think the numbers are shocking. There are also questions about what legacy infrastructure will be left behind, unlike the Olympics, which can leave host cities housing, transit, and sporting venues. It is very tough to justify when a third of your costs go into just policing and security, which are necessary costs. I mean, those have very few lasting impacts. And it could still cost more. With two years to go, officials say the final bill may still grow. Jimmy Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. A new movie out this weekend starring Canadian Ryan Gosling is paying tribute to one of the toughest and most dangerous jobs in Hollywood. When you're not invited to the party, that always hurts a little bit, you know what I mean? Why some say it's time stunt performers got more recognition. Plus, a story CBC broke first today, arrests in the killing of a sick activist in BC. There are separate and distinct investigations ongoing into these matters where the investigation could go next. Oh and later, the anatomy of a police chase gone terribly wrong. Oh my God! Are high-speed pursuits worth the risk? Two former senior officers weigh in. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Just outside St. John's, a ceremony for one of Canada's most beloved comedians. Rick Mercer thanked a high school theatre teacher during the celebration of his 2023 induction into Canada's Walk of Fame. My life is literally divided into two distinct parts. There was before Lois looked at me and said, you should write a play, and then afterwards, because everything changed when that happened, and it led to a career in comedy, and it led to this hour's 22 minutes, and it led directly here to this day. A commemorative Walk of Fame plaque was unveiled during the hometown ceremony. Mercer's induction was announced in December. A new action comedy is putting stunt performers in the spotlight. Canadian Ryan Gosling stars in The Fall Guy. Eli Glasner now with the death-defying stunts that these actors hope will launch them to new heights. Stunt after stunt, the promotional tour for The Fall Guy made it clear. It's time to honor Hollywood's unsung heroes. This movie is just a giant campaign to get stunts an Oscar. Let's go! Canadian stunt performers say they're ready. Whether it's falling out of a building or as a Spartan soldier, Jean Frenette is a veteran in a job where success means being not seen. If you watch the movie and you can you cannot tell the difference between the two, then we did our job really well. This may look like Antonio Banderas, but it's Vancouver's Loro Chantran del Valle. And these two cars are driving down my backside, screaming down at 50 miles an hour. It takes a toll. When you crash, you know, you still get whiplash, your, your internal organs get smashed around, it's, it's hard on your body. Being snubbed by the Oscars, that's a different kind of pain. When you're not invited to the party, that always hurts a little bit. You know what I mean? And when, when a movie comes out and it does great and everybody talks about how great it is, but who, who provided that action? Three, two, one. In Toronto, Angelica Lieskan is training the next generation of performers, even a certain uncoordinated reporter. 
No, you don't. Sorry. She says for too long, stunt people were kept in the shadows. We wanted to believe that it was the actor. We wanted to believe this was the person. And while the Oscars consider adding a category for stunts, it recently added awards for casting. A casting director is not going to die putting two actors together that have great chemistry. So where we're super happy for them, I, I think it's just people need to really understand and recognize what it is that we do. In the meantime, the Emmys, the Canadian Screen Awards, and more are already celebrating those who risk it all for our entertainment. In Lightmaster, CBC News, Toronto. Now it's time to dig deeper into the stories shaping our world. A high-speed police chase on Canada's busiest highway ends in disaster. How could it be justified? But first, arrests in British Columbia in the killing of prominent Sikh separatist Hardeep Singh Nijjar. We arrested and charged three individuals for first-degree murder. And police say the case may go further. We are investigating if there are any ties to the government of India. We'll talk about those arrests in a moment, but first some crucial details, courtesy of our colleagues at the Fifth Estate. Earlier this year, the team exclusively obtained security video from the scene of the killing. Their reporting was blocked by YouTube for access in India after a request from that country's government. Here's Bob McEwen. Based on eyewitness accounts and security video, we were able to piece together what happened the night Hardeep Singh Nijjar was killed. It is a unique step-by-step -step record of the alleged political assassination of a Canadian in Canada. It is Father's Day 2023, just before sundown. Hardeep Singh Nijjar walks out of the Surrey Sikh temple called the Gurdwara. This is the last known footage of him alive. Walking behind is Gurmeet Singh Tour, who we met in Surrey, and who says he also was warned by the RCMP that his life is in danger. Soon, Nidger's truck is seen pulling out of its parking spot, driving down the laneway that leads out of the lot. Then a white sedan appears on the other side of the lane. When Nidger's truck speeds up, the sedan does too. The white car suddenly pulls ahead of the truck and comes to a stop in front, blocking Nidger, who seems trapped in his pickup. Suddenly, two men in hoodies appear near the exit and run towards Nidger. They point firearms at the driver's seat and they begin to shoot. Then the white sedan exits the parking lot and disappears from view. The two men in hoodies follow running in the same direction. Gurdwara member Malkit Singh, who was nearby, told us he saw the two men in hoodies get into a silver Toyota Camry. This is security camera footage of that vehicle. With at least six men and two vehicles, it seems clear that Hardeep Singh Nijjar's murder was a large, well-organized operation. This is the actual security camera footage from that day. It is somewhat difficult to see because it's taken at a distance, so have slowed it down. This is Nidger's truck on the right of the screen. And this is the white sedan on the left. You can barely see them, but these are the two killers running towards Nidger's truck. It's at this moment that the shooting begins. And the white sedan pulls away. The two men are running in the same direction. At this point, Hardeep Singh Nijjar is either dead or dying.
Well, let's bring in Dan Stanton, an intelligence officer for CSIS for 32 years until 2018 and currently Director of National Security with the University of Ottawa Professional Development Institute. And Dan, first of all, from your perspective with your history in the intelligence service, what was your reaction to the arrest today? Well, my, my initial reaction was, was joy. I, I, I was uh, delighted at, at what's obviously a significant breakthrough in the police investigation. But at the same time, it's rather daunting to realize that a foreign state um, has come into Canada, um, not only killed a Canadian, may quite possibly have killed some others, some unexplained ho homicides. So it's, it's, uh, it is quite troubling. The foreign state you're referring to, of course, is, is India. Do you have any doubt in your mind at all that India is, is behind this murder plot? I'm quite confident uh, it's in India from, from you know, the Prime Minister's disclosure in September, the, the operation the Americans disrupted in New York, and the recent uh, acknowledgement through uh, the media of, of who was involved in RAW. Um, for me, there's no doubt. If we look at the criminal investigation, the RCMP is dealing with evidence and they're dealing with a future prosecution. So they're, of course, focused on that and are not going to want to bring anything in that might kind of disrupt that, that prosecution. And about the three men who were charged uh, in this case with murder, uh, relatively young men, uh, it's not as if India, if they are indeed behind this, sent agents from that country to here. Um, are, are you surprised by that? I was surprised. I was surprised that uh, uh, they may have been using our immigration stream uh, to carry out such a, 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 a dirty act. Um, this is going to raise an awful lot of questions uh, and, and some issues. But these three may not necessarily know who they were working for. We may have various layers or levels and middlemen involved, which provides sort of a firewall in a way for the government of India. They may have thought they were actually working for criminals to carry out these killings. It's been a few years since you worked with CSIS, but uh, do you have any sense of whether these three would, or the people who are directing them, would have been on CSIS's radar before the, the murders took place? It's highly unlikely that they would be in the services radar because, you know, uh, uh, they don't actually appear as what would be, you know, a strategic threat to national security. They're basically young individuals who, who came here on student visas and then carried out this act. So I think a lot of the CSIS intelligence collection on this would have been probably after the fact, unless they had, you know, some, some, I guess you could say, sharing from other partners and things like that. Uh, sources uh, close to the investigation have told CBC News that police are actively investigating possible links to, to three other murders in Canada. Um, again, from your perspective as a longtime former CSIS officer, uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, we do know, uh, you know, from the Fifth Estate piece as well, that there were other Sikhs, Canadian Sikhs, who had been warned. Uh, and we do have other homicides that perhaps have been a bit un uh, unexplained. So there may have been more than just those involved in Mr. Nijar's uh, killing. Uh, and, and that could be a reference to future arrests. It's, it's like probably more than one team, a number of targets. We know that from the operation in New York, where uh, the fellow in India talked about three or four more targets in Canada, and that could be what we're seeing playing out here. Uh, we have just seconds left, but uh, certainly in the Punjabi community, certainly in British Columbia and some other parts of the country, great deal of concern about what's happened here. More broadly in Canada, how concerned do you think Canadians should be about what we're seeing here? I think Canadians should be concerned. This isn't uh, diaspora politics. This isn't, uh, you know, South Asian issues. This is a Canadian issue. This is a Canadian who was murdered by, by a foreign state, and I think Canadians need to, need to take that seriously. And hopefully there will be a successful prosecution, and hopefully they'll also, if, if there's links to, to India, that that will be pursued. I have my doubts, but uh, it, there should at least be an effort made. Dan Stanton, really nice speaking with you tonight. My pleasure. You can watch the full Fifth Estate investigation into Hardeep Singh Nijar's murder and India's possible connection to it on the program's YouTube page and CBC Gem. Coming up, that shocking police chase that left four people dead. Oh my God! Questions about the safety of high-speed pursuits next on The Breakdown. A 
dramatic police chase going the wrong way on Canada's busiest highway ends in tragedy. Now, serious questions about what those officers did. Absolutely, there's no justification for carrying on with a pursuit of that nature. What justifies high-speed pursuits? We have two former senior police officers here to break it all down for us. And Cash, uh, let me start with you. Cash Sheed, uh, chief of the West Vancouver Police Force once upon a time, and before that, a senior officer for the Vancouver Police. What was your first thought when you heard about this high-speed chase? Well, I was certainly uh, engulfed in trying to figure out what happened when I learned some of the circumstances surrounding it. I was appalled that we have another uh, chase, uh, police pursuit that led to a fatality. We had multiple fatalities here, and I think this is something that uh, I've been dealing with over 32 years in law enforcement. And again, uh, we don't have the right balance right now to ensure that we don't have innocent people killed because of the actions of police and engaging in pursuits and continuing with pursuits. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but, but Sean Sparling, you're a former deputy police chief in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. What was your first reaction to, to the aftermath of this chase? Uh, my mind uh, was uh, was basically shock. I couldn't believe that this happened. Really turned to the families, the victims that uh, that died in this tragedy. My mind turned to the officers as well. Um, the impact it would have on the uh, police community. It was just utter devastation that uh, really shouldn't happen. Uh, let's back up for a moment and talk about high speed chases, which I'm sure both of you have been involved uh, with over the years in in your careers. Uh, Sean, what's it like to be? in a police car when you make that decision to start a chase? Well, certainly uh, the, uh, your adrenaline will go up and uh, you get uh, really into the moment. Um, it can be uh, very scary at times, uh, but you also try to be very much in control and control what you're doing. Uh, but it can be a, a life-threatening event, quite honestly. And, and Cash, take us back 25, 30, well, probably more years than that. You as a young officer, the first few times when you flipped on the lights and siren and, and you started to chase. Well, again, your uh, heart starts to pump. You're fully engaged in it. You create some tunnel vision. At the same time, you're trying to thin slice all the information that's coming into you. And your only motive is to get after this uh, suspect that is fleeing from you. And you don't see some of the things that other officers may see. And you don't hear some of the things that a supervisor will be listening to to ensure whether their pursuit will continue or be discontinued. I looked at the pursuit policies from various provinces and agencies, and, and all the ones I looked at have language similar to Ontario's Community Safety and Policing Act. And let me read one section of that. A police officer shall not initiate a vehicle pursuit unless the officer has first determined that the risk to public safety that may result from the pursuit is outweighed by the risk to public safety that may result if an individual in the fleeing motor vehicle is not immediately apprehended. And, and, and let's take a look at some dash cam video from a driver on the 401 that day. And, and I think anybody looking at this and, and seeing that, that uh, vehicle that's being pursued suddenly go the wrong way can imagine what it would be like to be on a divided highway and suddenly be confronted by that. Cash, is there any chance that the need to arrest this driver, wanted for allegedly robbing a, a liquor store and threatening someone with a knife, outweighed the potential danger of this chase? No, not at all. A matter of fact, uh, I really question whether the uh, officer should have stopped the pursuit after he initially engaged it, whether the supervisor should have come on the air to discontinue the pursuit. And especially, you've got to look at how prolonged this pursuit was. We're talking about 20 minutes and the point where they started making significant unsafe maneuvering, uh, that be it going on the opposite direction of the 401 at 8 o'clock at night when it's a busy freeway, absolutely you cannot justify in continuing that pursuit regardless of even what the crime was committed unless you're chasing someone that just killed a group of people. Even at that point, Ian, you have to continually assess and reassess whether it's worth the risk of continuing on with that pursuit. Sean, what's your view? Do you, do you think that, that in this situation, uh, pursuing a vehicle the wrong way on the 401 could be justified? Well, I think all the, uh, all the uh, review and 
analysis is going to start right from the initial start of this pursuit. Was it necessary or was it not? And that's where it all starts. When it gets up onto the uh, up onto the 401, really that uh, everything's kind of gone out the window at that point. I'm sure the officers were uh, were considering in their own mind: sh should they be pursuing? Should they stop and pull off and let what's going to happen happen? Or should they be trying to warn? Uh, uh, the other motorists using their lights and sirens and all that, but by the time they got up onto the 401, um, it's really going to be about the analysis whether or not they should have engaged in the, in the pursuit in the first place. But I, I, I know you want to be careful here, Sean, and, and we don't know all the details, yeah. but, but can you imagine a circumstance where it would have been justified, uh, given what we know about what happened, and then you know, justified to, to do that chase the wrong way on the highway? Yeah, see, I, uh, Exactly. I'm trying not to speculate too much here, but I'm, I expect that's what's going to go through their mind. This is going to be a very, very high test to uh, to justify what happened here or to actually pursue something on the wrong way in the 401. But I suspect what they're going to say is that they felt it was necessary to stay behind him in order to warn the oncoming uh, motors. But uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, going to be helpful in the end, but I, I suspect that's where the explanation is going to go. Cashew were, as I mentioned, a former police chief. West Vancouver has a freeway uh, running right by it or through it, I guess, to an extent. Um, what kind of discussions do you hope or think police agencies across the country are having now in the days after this chase? Well, I can tell you, Ian, there is absolutely no justification for this pursuit to carry on to, in the manner that it did. They will use the excuse that they were trying to warn the traffic, but regardless, the suspect vehicle was traveling at a high rate of speed on the wrong side of the 401, the busiest freeway in all of Canada. Ian, I've reviewed hundreds of these. I've done some of the research with PERF with respect to what goes on in pursuits. I've rewritten policies in Vancouver. I've outfitted and trained our officers when I was with Vancouver Police Department on different techniques to stop the pursuit within the first two blocks. And at that point, the supervisor has to make that decision whether it's continuing on or not. We give them the skills, we give them the tools, we hope that we have air support in order to take over uh, from this. But at the end of the day, I'm sorry, Ian, and your guests may uh, disagree with me. There is no justification for this. Three people's worlds, innocent people's worlds, were taken away from them as a result of what we think may have been a, a, a on the high end, a robbery. Secondly, just a property crime offense. Sean, we have just maybe 30 seconds left. Last word to you. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of what we have to do right now is uh, wait for these reviews to happen. I think there's a lot of very important questions to be asked, and I think it's uh, rightfully so that the police are going to have to justify what we did, what they did. But at the end of the day, right now, what we're doing is we're doing a lot of speculating, and we're doing it based off a lot of leaked information as well, and some of the video. But we have to wait and see what the uh, the review says. Uh, I do have some uh, share some of the uh, same concerns that Cash has, but. Uh, I think we should uh, just wait until this investigation is completed and actually tells us what exactly happened and what the officers were thinking. All right, Sean Sparling, Kashid, I appreciate both of you, your experience and your willingness to uh, give us your analysis. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Coming up, a very rare sighting in central Alberta. It was just amazing to see because they're so rare. I teared up because it just, it felt so special and so magical. The White Spirit Moose is next in our moment. What you're looking at is an incredibly rare all-white moose, or spirit moose, as it's called. The animal is thought to be a good omen in some Indigenous communities. It certainly was for the photographers Teresa and Darlene Tanner. The two are out looking for captivating storm scenes when they stumbled upon the elusive animal instead. Their lucky encounter with the spirit moose makes our moment. We were totally caught off guard. I teared up because it just, it felt so special and so magical. We were driving around central Alberta. We do that a lot for uh, locations for storm chasing and just happened upon this white moose, the spirit moose. It was just amazing to see because they're so rare. We just took out our cameras and actually spent a half an hour to an hour with it. We've never seen anything white before like that. It's a gene that they're born with, and it's like one in 20,000. I'm part Cree, so to us, it's a sacred animal, and if you ever see one in your lifetime, 
it's supposed to bring good fortune, good luck. And I looked over at Teresa and I, I had tears in my eyes and I told her, you know, this is like a once in a lifetime thing and I'm so glad that we could share this together. And they're happy, as you can see, to share the pictures and the video of that. What they will not disclose, however, is the location of the animal in order to keep it safe from hunters. Uh, you may also notice that the moose had pigment in its eyes, so it doesn't have albinism, but as they say, a different genetic trait. That is The National for May 3rd. I hope you join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network, and later that night right here for The National. Have a great Saturday.